Okay. Um, good evening, everyone. Let's say the prayers, and we'll start for tonight. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, both now and into the ages of ages. Amen. Glory to thee, our God. Glory to thee. O heavenly King, comfort the spirit of truth, who hath everywhere present and fills all things, treasure of blessings, and giver of life, come and abide in us, and cleanse us from every impurity, and save our souls, a good one. Lord of mercy, Lord of mercy, Lord of mercy, glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, both now and into the ages of ages. Amen. Through the face of our Holy Fathers, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and save us. Amen. Once again, good evening, everyone. Thank you for showing up. Well, we'll, um, we'll continue today where we stopped the last time. As I promised you, we will talk about, uh, after we finish the book of, uh, the book, 100 Words of Love by St. Nikolai Vilimirovich, uh, we will uh, talk a little bit about one subject that I think is very important that I just mentioned. It's about uh, the Orthodox understanding of death and um, or the blessed remembrance of death and to see what not just uh, the fathers from the old uh, uh, old ages of, of the first, of the fourth, of the fifth, and so on centuries, but even what some of the modern fathers uh, that lived in the 20th and the 21st century uh, thought about that subject and to, to kind of try to uh, do that um, uh, comparison with, with today's um, uh, with today's understanding. So uh, after we finish those two topics, maybe somewhere in the middle of the Lent of the Great Lent, we will talk also about the meaning of the Great Lent. We go from one Sunday to another Sunday, the meaning of, let's say, the first Sunday that we have now coming which is the Sunday of the, the Pharisee and the publican, then the prodigal son, and the, son, the, the Sunday of the, of the uh, judgment, uh, where we remind ourselves about the second coming of Christ and his judgment, and what are the criteria of salvation uh, based on the, the reading of the gospel for that day. Of course, then the last Sunday, the Sunday of forgiveness. And we were slowly going to enter within the adventure of the fast, when we actually start to fast in the Lent. So we have the first Sunday of Orthodoxy, we will have the Sunday of uh, St. Gregory Palamas, then we have the Sunday of the Cross, which is the middle Sunday uh, of, uh, of the Lent, and the Sunday of um, dedicated to St. John the Climacus of uh, Mount Sinai, the Sunday of uh, St. Mary of Egypt, and then the Passion Week, actually coming the, the Sunday of the Palm Sunday, Lazarus Sunday and Palm Sunday, the Passion Week, and of course the Resurrection, and of course the Sundays following the Resurrection. It's all part of the something that we call the Lenten Triodion and the Pentecostal Triodion uh, or the Resurrectional Triodion. It's a book that uh, tracks uh, the theology or, or the, 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 all of the services before and after Pascha uh, until Pentecost, where we uh, start basically with the, we celebrate the birth of the church and we move on into the, into the calendar year. So that's one of the most important events of the Orthodox Church in the church calendar. And we're going to talk about uh, extensively about what's the meaning behind all of it. So, but we have plenty of topics to, uh, to cover. Hopefully, Father uh, Matthew will be able to join us uh, some of these days, some of these Bible studies, and, and give his uh, input into our Bible studies. So let's uh, let's move on. I'll share the screen with you. Uh, let me see here. Okay. So uh, we'll continue where we stop. The last time, which is the topic of uh, of the the word, hundred words of love, the book of uh, Saint Nikolai Velimirovich. I think it's an important topic. Uh, we we would like to finish it as much as we can, and then we'll move on to the uh, to the other topics. So last time we talked about, we finished with the verse fifty. It says, Father Kalista, he writes this to uh, his spiritual daughter. Uh, the following, uh, here now, daughter, this mystery as well. God is a perfect person, which is why he is perfect love. God is a perfect person, which is why he is perfect truth. God is a perfect person, which is why he is a perfect life. This is why Christ spoke this earth-shaking words to the word universe. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. The way beginning, the way being love. This is why love being the way is the foremost, for only through love one can attain truth and life. Therefore, again, in God's scripture, it is said, if anyone does not love the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be accursed. This is 1 Corinthians 16.22. How can the one who does not love not be accursed? Therefore, 
be without truth and life. Such a one has accursed himself. This is a, a very in, uh, interesting um, observation by Father Callistus because outside of the outside of our love of Christ, we are not just lost, but we are experiencing the most tragic um, uh, existential uh, crisis in our life, which is the spiritual death, and we can all be partakers or participants uh, to, the, to the eternal life, especially in the liturgical sense, but also we can become participants of the liturgical death, and that is the life without the liturgy or the, the life without uh, Christ. As you know, Christ says, without me, you can't do anything. And in the perspective of Christ, Christianity itself becomes, and the people who are calling themselves Christians have become the Christ-centric people. Their whole life has become centered around Christ. When you compare the life of, uh, uh, of, of the Christians in the past and even now to the, to the people of the world, who are, to, let's say, don't believe in Christ, you will see there are two types of, uh, of antidotes, of, of differences, of contrasts. You see, you see the life of the world being completely anthropocentrical or um, centered around the human beings or humanistic, while the Christians don't have uh, and we cannot have uh, uh, the attitudes of understanding our life being humanistic, but rather only Christ-centric. Uh, so even when we call ourselves Christians, and this is one thing that we talked about last uh, uh, yesterday, last evening, when we had the catechism classes, that the reason why we, have, we are calling ourselves Christians is not because it's just a name that was given to us. The Christians were not being called Christians up until the, 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 the second part of the second century, where for the first time, the Christians in Antioch were being called Christians by the Roman government. Prior to that, they were not distinguishable between the, uh, the Jewish uh, population, the Jewish faith, and uh, some sort of a fraction of it. And that's, that's how they were always referred as, as, as the Jews. And, and everyone, all the Gentiles who would join and be believing Christ, become Christians, they would not call themselves Christians, but rather they would uh, become the proselytes within the Jewish faith because Christ is the fulfillment of the, the, the Judaistic expectation of the coming of, of the Messiah. So being him the fulfillment of the law and the prophets, uh, this name Christianity or Christians was given to us later. But the very purpose of the word uh, Christian is not about the name, but, be, but about the acquiring of the identity of Christ, not just in a form or as an idea or just as a nickname or a way to describe a, a certain people or a certain population, but rather um, a, a living participation in Christ. For that reason, we call ourselves Christians because not just we carry his name, but because we also eat and drink Christ. Christ becomes tangible to us, not only in, in our ideas or in our intellectual capacity to, to understand and process the words of the gospel, but rather because on the liturgical aspect, on our everyday life, especially every Sunday, when we gather together around the chalice, we eat and we drink Christ. And uh, in, in this sense, the, the famous German uh, philosopher Feuerbach, he said, people are what they eat. So if you eat chicken, you're a chicken. If you eat pig, you're a pig. But if you eat Christ, you're a Christian. So the identity that we have is Christ, nothing else. And for that reason, the importance of, the, uh, of, of our connection with Christ becomes essential uh, to, to our existence, especially uh, relevant to the, to, to the future, to the eschaton, to the eternity. So uh, the, the, the love for Christ is, is only the natural. Christ becomes the firstborn. He becomes the firstborn among the dead, as St. Paul describes it. He becomes uh, the first in all things so that uh, we can follow his example and acquire the mind or the mindset of Christ. As St. Paul says, I don't live anymore, but Christ lives in me. And that the whole purpose of our life is to uh, grow up to the measure of Christ according to our abilities, according to our potential. Of course, everything is done with the grace of the Holy Spirit, but uh, Christ wants us to come for him, not in order to make us go to him, to force us, but rather for uh, allowing us to long for him, to, to want it, to, for us to want to be with him. So uh, he continues in verse 51 and 52, the body cannot either love or hate. A body cannot fall in love with a body. 
The ability to love belongs to the soul. When the soul falls in love with the body, this is not love, but desire, lust. Look at how, how actual these words are by uh, Father Callistus when he talks about the differences between how people understand love today. Today, uh, when we see in the movies, what we see in the modern culture, what we see in the, in the books, on the internet, love has been perverted to a, such a point that the iconography of the devil or the demonography or through pornography, through all this undecent exposure to the nakedness of the bodies has become this perverted version of what actual love is. So uh, is the, even there is an attack that uh, the, the Christians were the one who wanted to, uh, God forbid, suppress, let's say, the sexual um, aspect of, of the human existence uh, by, uh, you know, preaching about monogamous, uh, mono monogamous marriages, by uh, preaching about uh, restrainment and, and being ability to withhold ourselves or control ourselves to learn how to govern ourselves as something very rigid, something very uh, retrograde or something very old and anachron and whatnot. But the, the other outcome, other than Christ, uh, love without Christ, becomes a perversion, becomes a pornography, becomes a, a decadence uh, love. Love that it's not love, but as in uh, Callistus says, desire and lust. And he continues, when a soul falls in love with the soul, not through God, this is either admiration or piety. And this is what we call also sentimentalism. Because, uh, you know, we are not even aware that sometimes that what we think what we admire in life, let's say art, or, uh, or just uh, respect for beauty, but aesthetics that, it, that belongs only to this world, can easily delude us to think that, that it's love, and we can become passionate about it, but this love can also be perverted into sentimentalism, into just uh, a piety of sort, or admiration, uh, or just uh, uh, lust for, for uh, aesthetical pleasure but not true love that comes from the, from the spiritual uh, life, from the Holy Spirit. When a soul falls in love with a soul through God, so here's the difference. There is a love uh, from soul to soul without God and not through God, regardless of the appearance of the body, beauty, ugliness, this is love. This is true love, my daughter. And in love, there is life. There is freedom. There is breathing. So he, uh, on purpose, he uses this metaphor, he uses this words, because as you know, from the beginning of the story, before the writing of this letter, when we talked about the life of the hunchback Eula, which is Kassiani, the nun, uh, she was uh, handicapped as a person, and uh, she considered herself as an ugly, uh, ugly girl. Uh, and that's why she was tricked by this, uh, her alleged uh, fiancé who was supposed to marry her. Uh, because he was embarrassed of her, and so she canceled the marital agreements and whatnot. She, that's why she wanted to kill him, and, and you know the whole story what happened. But in order for her to understand the depth of, of her beauty is not to see herself through the prism or through the lens of her physical body or through her sentimental or soul understanding of, of, of herself, but rather... Tuesday or Wednesday. Uh, but to no, see it's Wednesday. herself only through the... Uh, through the beauty of, of, uh, of God. And that's the only love that is sustainable, the only life that can bring life, that is life itself. So in, in verse 52, he continues, the scientists or the scientists attracts with knowledge, the wealthy with wealth, the beautiful with beauty, the skillful with skill. Each of them attracts a limited number of people. Only love attracts all human beings. Each of them attracts, uh, the attraction of love is limitless, both the learned and the ignorant, the rich and the poor, the skilled and the unskilled, the beautiful and the ugly, the healthy and the sick, young and old, they all want to be loved. Christ spread his love over all and attracted all to himself with love. With his love, he also encompassed the dead and long decayed and forgotten. He refers to Lazarus, and with the ugly, he refers to the blind, to the sick, that he was healing, to, the, uh, to those who were possessed by demons, and so on. Men, even when death wants to be loved, even after that, he fights against death. This is why many of them try to leave wills and testaments so that they will secure some love for themselves after they die. 
both the living and the dead want to be loved. Relatives may hate, may, may have love for their relatives. And Christ said, and I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself, John 12, 32. Elevated on the cross out of love for everyone with his sacrifice, he attracted everything to himself, even the souls of the departed in Hades. Before Christ, my daughter, there was no teaching of love nor religion of love. And this is indeed true because only in Christ we see this breaking point of the human history where uh, the, the light of his presence with his epiphany uh, as the Messiah, as the, the prophet, as the first among the prophets, the first among the hierarchs, and the, uh, the only hierarch, he reveals this change that we're invited to, that this potential to come back to ourselves only through love. And the language is, is called love. But this love, it's not the one that he says in verse 52, mixed or confused with, with the, the aesthetical love, the, the love of the body, or the love of the, of the passions. Because sometimes even the, uh, the sent because that it uh, transfigures itself into a sentimental love that only brings death and disappointment, not the true love. The true love is the one that uh, is not dependent on anything and it's not restrained with anything. It's free from everything. And that's why it brings life and freedom to people who possess it. But this love only comes from love. So the apostle of love and reasons and John writes, don't love the world or the things that are in the world. If anyone loves the world, the Father's love isn't in him, 1 John 2.15. Further on, he gives a reason why one should not love the world. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life isn't the Father's, but it's the world's. The world is passing away with its lust, but he also who does God's will remains forever. First John 2, 16 to 17. So the three of these, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, foremost on account of knowledge, the three ancient temptations to which Satan tricked Eve, but not Christ. You see, in the Garden of Eden, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life was um, the, the, the temptations that even Christ experienced as Eve and, and, and Adam experienced in the, in the Garden of Eden. Uh, the, the idea that they can become gods, the idea of the, the pleasant uh, uh, presence of the, of the tree of knowledge and its fruits, and, and that they can become participants in this uh, mystical wisdom of somehow knowing to be able to discern the good from the bad, but separating uh, uh, because of that from, from their creator, from God, uh, will give them some sort of an advantage or, or some sort of enlightenment was the, 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 the real temptation. The same type of temptation comes again to, to Christ on the desert when the devil approaches him. And we will talk about this, of course, when we read the gospel in details to understand that basically when we examine our life, we also throughout life, we experience these types of temptations that are mainly about the lust of the flesh the lust of the eyes, of the pleasure of the things that we see, when we see things that are um, in, in interesting to us, important to us, that uh, uh, kind of elevates our ego right, and gives us pleasure. Or the, the pride of life itself, which is glory, which is money, which is social status, which is power and over other people and so forth. Demonic uh, love that people are willing to, to, because of the satisfying in defending or having, if they have already these passions to defend, they're willing to kill their brothers and sisters in order to remain in power. We are witnessing the human history about so many times. But in Christ, this is, this is the breaking point. In Christ, we see the perfect example of how to fight off those things. Christ, what does he say to the devil? He says, not only from every word, uh, not uh, only from bread shall men live, but from every word that comes out from God. Uh, it should be sufficient for, for people to have a life in themselves. So he continues, and Anthony the Great says, lust is the beginning of sin. Love is the beginning of salvation and the kingdom of heaven. You know, Saint, uh, Anthony the Great was this uh, famous, uh, uh, one of the first known monks who lived by himself uh, in the desert. Uh, in, we're talking about the third century. Uh, who, because of his uh, way of fighting with the demons, he was many times considered to be dead uh, and killed. Uh, and, and he would come back and continue to, uh, with his 
permanent life in, into the desert to acquire this holiness that will be an example to a lot of new generations of monks who will come and follow. He is the one most beloved among the monks because uh, he uh, showed us that as long as we hold on to Christ, even though if we live by ourselves, we can still achieve this union with God in a monastic way of life, but delivering ourselves from the passions, from the temptations of the body and of the soul. So love and lust are contrary. Whosoever calls lust as if it's love, errs towards love, for love is spiritual, pure, and holy, and lust is carnal, impure, and unholy. You remember many times uh, we repeat the words of Metropolitan uh, Athanasius of Lemesol, who said, God is love, as St. John, uh, uh, the theologian says, but love is not God. And that's why we as Christians, we can never agree with those pamphlets that we see or those billboards say love is love, usually in, in support of the, uh, of the alphabet people uh, regarding their, uh, you know, uh, just in, in their effort to justify their perverted passions, whether it's homosexualism, whether, whether it's uh, something else. I recently heard, and this is devastating, and probably you will hear it very soon, that now there are serious uh, institutions around the world, everywhere, especially in the Western world, is trying to legitimize and find a different linguistic approach to explain the love between a minor and an adult, that it shouldn't be punishable by, by law. And that uh, as long as there is no a victim in a sense of uh, the child is not hurt, that person should not go to prison. And we should have this condescending understanding for people who are literally pedophiles. And we should not call them pedophiles, but they invent different names like lovers of minors or whatever. Uh, this is something that is happening. This is when we delude ourselves to the idea that lust can somehow become love, then that kind of perverted love, it's far, complete opposite of the love that we see in the Christian church, that we see in the fathers, that we see in the writings of the apostles. And this is something that is happening in front of our eyes. So uh, this, this perversion will not stop. We'll go into them uh, being able to get married with animals, uh, zoophilia. You know, it's, it's another disgusting perversion. But you know, the devil, he's um, in his uh, contrarianism towards God, everything that is human, everything that is created by God, everything that was a gift from God, he uses it and perverts it and makes it sweet and deludes people that this is the way they should go, which is completely opposite. Of it. So that's why we have this uh, enormous difference between how the, the Christian church understands the world and how the world understands the, the, the church. So love is inseparable from truth and lust from illusions and lies. In general, true love insist, um, instantly grows in strength and exhilaration regardless of age, lust, of the, on the other hand, passes away quickly, turns into re revulsion, and often leads to despair. If you remember Cassiani, the, the, re the reader of these words, uh, she, she wanted to kill her, uh, she wanted to kill the bridegroom, her former fiance, because he disappointed her, and she said, I'm going to finish him. She, she brought a gun into the church, and she wanted to kill him, but then she encountered her Callistus, who talked to her. So now he's using her personal example to explain to her the differences, the love that she had for her fiance, which was false, uh, while, while comparing that to the true love that comes from God. But now, instead of having as a bridegroom or as her husband, that man who cheated on her and abandoned her before even they got married, now she has as her husband and her bridegroom, Christ himself, with whom she can truly be married. And that's what happens to her. She becomes a nun, lives in the monastery and dies as a, as, a, as a nun, being married to the church and to Christ. That which is not to be judged in animals is to be judged in people. All of our knowledge about animals cannot explain the inner disposition of animals. We cannot tell what's inside of them, only what is on the outside. However, we can say with certainty that they live according to their nature, according to their gift, and as a determined and as determined by the creator, equally and always, all according to their species, unmistakable. One cannot talk about sin in animals, but man does, not, does sin if he lives according to animalistic desires. 
and he even dares call those desires love. It is also not possible for a man to stoop to the level of animals without becoming lower than the animals. You see this paradox of, of us um, not even being aware that, that, that sometimes uh, when we are deluded into the perverted understanding of love, we are not just imitating the animals, but we sometimes behave worse than the animals in expression of our passions or uh, in our deluded desire to satisfy our, our, our passions and our lusts. So uh, the only way we, we, we come back to ourselves is to learn how to govern ourselves and then paradoxically in our mind, thinking that we are lower than the animals. There was an interesting statement by St. Paisius of Mount Athos who um, one, one of the, the, the people who came to him to talk to him and asked him, well, get on the, how do you succeed to humble yourself before you pray? Because they were talking about prayer and St. Pisces was talking to them that before even we sit down to pray, to do our prayer rule, we need to learn how to listen in silence. We need to learn how to control our breathing, to focus on the beats of the heart so that we can uh, being prepared slowly in silence to start first the Jesus prayer, and when we say the Jesus prayer to transfer with our mind into the, the mystical reality of, 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 of his passion and his death, death, so that understand the meaning of his sacrifice that he gave, not just for the human kind, but for the, uh, the entirety of existence. But he said you know, to the question, how do you humble yourself? How do you get there? He said, well, sometimes I just think about the fact that instead of me, God, uh, he created me a human instead of becoming a lizard or a mule. So at least I feel in some way the appreciation of God's love towards me that he gave me uh, the ability to be a human being, to express him in language, to, to be able to, to glorify him, to sing God, to, to celebrate him in, a, in, his, in my, own, uh, uh, my own way as a human being. That doesn't mean that the animals, they don't glorify God. They do the same thing. But uh, we as humans, as being the crown of creation, we have ability uh, beyond that. So um, the perversion of love is, is the, 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 the problem. That this perversion happens with something that we call in the church prelis or spiritual delusion. Something that uh, can, and can lead us to in a very, very uh, 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 speed highway to, towards the spiritual death. 57, if someone says man must live according to, its, to his nature, we ask, according to which nature? Is it according to his original sinless heavenly, just as God created man nature? Or is it according to the other one, the sick, humiliated, polluted by demons, disfigured by vices, deadened by passions? For God did not create man just as he created the rest of nature, but he did it in a special way. Above all, he gave him authority over nature. With this man is clearly exempt from the rest of the physical world, the fish, birds, beasts, and he is elevated above all zoologies and, or, and all and or studies of apes. Christ came to renew the original and real nature of man. Only those who live according to this renewed nature truly live according to human nature. Zoology is stupid at the feet of anthropology. So even in, uh, in uh, if you remember when we talked about Darwin's theory and how the church fathers completely reject uh, Darwinism and the, 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 the evolution that he is trying to uh, uh, impose on people as the only uh, logical explanation of the, the, the origin of the species, we uh, see that this is a tendency uh, of the many philosophers through the period of the Enlightenment and then later with the modern modernism, existentialism, modernism, postmodernism, to somehow infuse into people's minds that we are nothing more than just apes. So according to that, we should, you know, come back to our primal desires and give ourselves in to the animalistic nature of the animal kingdom. This is the, the, the demonic uh, twist of the origin of the human nature. 
Saint Pi uh, uh, I think it was Saint Porphyrios. He said, "If you would only know how much Satan hates the world and the humankind, if he had the blessing or the, the authority by God to do that, he would destroy the earth in less than a second. He would burn everything that was put in existence. But because he's held on by God's love and the grace not to do that, he can only uh, stay uh, uh, from a distance." And, and only shoots with, with spiritual er, uh, errors and try to delude the humankind and, and convince us that we are animalistic, that we are nothing more than apes. So that's why in the church, it's, there is even a, um, not just a, a, a scientific reason why we disagree with, uh, with, the, uh, with Darwinism and, and his ways of, of understanding of human nature, but rather there is a Christological reason because if the animals were so important, Christ would have also, or God, would have also brought some sort of a salvation for the animals in that sort. But he became a man like all of us. So uh, what, what we're going to uh, understand from this is that uh, we see the effects of this that was that Father Kalisas was talking about in his time. Now it's just being more and more obvious in our time. Uh, that this... Uh, the, the, uh, bringing the animalism or animalism, uh, uh, trying to bring the animalism into the human nature is something natural, something normal, which is, of course, far from, from the truth of God from Christ. So when man is renewed in Christ, he lives with his renewed nature, renewed mind, heart, and will. These three characteristics of the soul are leavened, or leavened with the yeast of the Holy Spirit, so that the three of them would equally be able to accommodate within the heavenly love of the Trinity, which surpasses reason. This is why the apostles talk about a new man in the likeness of Christ. Remember, when we get baptized, as we spoke yesterday about our catechism class, we die with our old selves. And on the day of the baptism, as you have noticed, many of us, we have different names. Um, it, it's good if you can preserve the, the, the name that is given to you by birth, but the real name the church accepts only is the one that we receive on baptism. And sometimes people have different names of baptism because they're born with a new identity in Christ. Because after the baptism, they're also chrismated with the chrism of the Holy Spirit, with the seal of the gift of the Holy Spirit on all of their five senses, and they receive on themselves the Pentecost of salvation. So the, the baptism is the the death and the resurrection, three times immersions into the water and, and three times resurrecting from the water, means that we are putting aside into the holy water that was blessed our old self, and now we are being born again. We are being born in the spiritual life in Christ and chrismated with the chrism of Pentecost. And of course, at the end of the death, we are uh, sealed with the Holy Eucharist by becomes, becoming full members, participants of Christ and receiving Christ inside of ourselves. So this is the, 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 the reason in the, in, the, in the mystery, if you like, the sacrament of us becoming in the likeness of Christ. That the whole purpose of our life is to, to become Christ's, little Christ's. For this reason, the same apostle says, the old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become anew. This is 2 Corinthians 5.17. For the old to expire and become new in order for the rusty iron to become shiny steel, in order for the hills of dirt piled upon humanity to be tossed into the chasm and and above human strength was needed and an immeasurable greater love towards creatures despised even by their own selves there was no such strength nor love nor courage nor on earth it had to come from above and it did come for god so loved the world that he gave his he, he, he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life these are maybe one of my most um, uh, most beautiful verse of the whole Bible, because uh, this is in the Gospel of St. John. Uh, this is uh, St. John uh, uh, in, in his writing, when he says the following, that he basically, being himself a Jew, uh, to dare to say the words that God can become a flesh, like he writes in his Gospel, is sarkothike o theos, become, received sarks, he, behave, he received uh, flesh, was considered to be the most blasphemous thing you can say. You could be stoned to death according to the Jewish law. So to see him giving us the most perfect example that God so loved the world that he gave, he gives his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. 
And he even more beautifully in his gospel, he says um, about Christ that he's uh, in one essence with, with God the Father, that God who is in his bosom reveals, uh, uh, reveals his son coming for the salvation of the, of the world so that everyone who becomes participants in, in Christ inherits the, the eternal life. So this is how the Son of God came down from heaven, God's power and God's wisdom to revive the deadened world with his love. Earth shook on two occasions, continues Father Carlos, under Christ's love. The first time when he suffered death on the cross so that he would redeem humankind from sin and death, and the second time when he freed the slaves of hates and resurrected in splendor and glory. These two earthquakes came and went, but the quaking of the human heart from his burning love was extended, first and foremost, through his first order of apostles and myrrh-bearing women, and then through the armies of his future followers throughout the centuries all over the world. Burning with Christ's love, his former persecutor shouted out, I count all things to be a loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus. This is in, the, uh, in 3.8. This very same Saul, Paul, is writing as if with lightning and not with a quill. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Could oppression or anguish or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword, even as it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through, whom, through him who loved us. For I am persecuted, I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor death, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from God's love, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. It's in Romans 8, 35, 39. You should know, my daughter, that all the hordes of hell run away from, from a man with such a love. I came to throw fire on earth, says the Lord. This is the heavenly fire of love that does not give away any smoke, nor does it have anything corporal or material, lustful, or unholy. This is the kind of love that ingredient and intoxicated all the apostles as well as many of the saints. Their hearts were emptied of bodily transient desires, and they lifted up only towards him, the only beloved one, asking nothing of the world, but giving it everything because of him. So, uh, let's finish with verse 63, and we'll, 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 we'll pause here. This all-encompassing love may refer only to a person and, own, and not to some sort of a principle or law or nature. See, even earthly love, even if we may even call it love, is tied to some person, not to a principle or a law or mute creation. The efforts of the worldly uh, wise men to convince men of an impersonal God, both before and after Christ, were in vain. They would sink like water through a sea. However, even the peoples who had a personal God or gods never had in their pantheons the one God so full of love manifested in the world through the person of Jesus Christ, the God. -man. So this, this emphasis on uh, our love for, the, for God as a person is very important to understand in the old Christian soteriology, which is the, what we call the, the Christian science of salvation, uh, all of the fathers, they emphasize the fact of the person. And we, if you remember, we talked many times that only in Christianity, the person understood as an ipostas in, in Greek, is the one who can live with the others, while the individual can live without the others. And in the logic of the church, my brother, my sister is my salvation. So we attach ourselves to the person. And the love can only truly be expressed or brought into life or exist between us only if it's exchangeable between people, between persons. Uh, that's why we call the love towards items, the love towards money, towards glory, towards vain things, towards things that are dead in, 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 in essence, our love uh, that is um, passionate love. It's lust. It's a perversion of love. It's a false love. Uh, love that has nothing to do with the, with the love that is bringing life. And this uh, is very important for us to understand. Very important to understand in the church that um, this, the, 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 the ability to discern between the emotional, sentimental love on one hand 
the lustful, the fleshly, the, the, the decadent love of the body, on the other hand, and the spiritual love that comes from God. If you remember, we, we talked about Serene of Lyon, one of the first uh, uh, teachers of the church who were ordained by the apostles to be a bishop. He was talking about that every human being is constituted with three basically ontological levels. The first one is the soul, the first one is the body, the second one is the soul, and the third one is the spirit. If the soul, which finds itself in the midst, the, the spirit and the body, moves more towards the body, will become materialistic, will become more animalistic, will become um, deluded or obsessed with the pleasures of the body and the needs of the body, and the body will become its tyrant or its guardian. But if the soul chooses to move towards the spirit, then pulls the body with itself to sanctify it towards the spirit, and her herself is sanctified by the Holy Spirit. And we will live in our life in this constant dichotomy, of constant making the choices. What are we wanting to do with ourselves? Do we want to break free from the needs of the, of the, of the passions of the, of the world, and even more of our own bodies, because even our bodies will one day decay, will die, will Will, will, will be uh, separated from us and, and, and instead of con uh, uh, unite ourselves with the Spirit, with the Holy Spirit, by that we mean. Because based on the choices that we make, we, uh, we are uniting ourselves either with, with the flesh, uh, or become animalistic, or uniting ourselves with the Holy Spirit and become one of God. So all of the tools that the church has given us, which is most of all prayer and fasting, then of course, holy repentance through confession and um, giving alms and, and all these different sacraments and services that we do in the church. They're all given to us not because God needs them. As many times we can read in the Psalms, God doesn't need our offerings. He doesn't need our, I don't know, young bulls that we're going to offer on his altar. He doesn't need, uh, he needs a humble heart and, and, and a humble spirit. He needs humility. He needs us to, to teach us to understand that the true love that comes from his is undiluted, undefiled by anything of this world. And is the true love that, that can live in, in us as long as we are um, uh, moving towards him. So if we move one mile towards God, he moves with 1,000 miles towards us all the time, but not by force, not by imposing himself, but allowing us uh, to, for us to be willing to make the choice to go towards him. So I would uh, stop today with, uh, uh, with this today. I just wanted to move on to a different uh, topic for a second, unless uh, in the meantime, you have any questions that you would like to, um, to ask about this, what we talked. Uh, the, what I would focus most uh, of this is to understand that even in the world we live today, the, we have this perverted understanding of love and uh, no matter how popular those ideas become uh, in the popular culture, in the, in the modern society, or even sometimes unfortunately accepted with certain uh, groups of people who call themselves Christians or even the church, they, they allow these things to happen. And you know what I'm referring to, the perversions of love. We have to stand orthodox into this understanding of love. Orthodoxy means orthos, in Greek means standing upright, orthos. That's when you, when you serve the matins. That's why we usually stand up because during the matin service, we stay up front. Orthodoxia and doxa means slava. Orthodox are not just the one who belong to a certain a church affiliation or denomination, but those who want to celebrate God in honor, in, in glory, and in a proper worship, undiluted by heretical teachings, undefiled by uh, influences of, of the movements of the cultures of the world, but rather stay firm in their own faith. That's what orthodoxy means. And this also, we need to understand that the true orthodox understanding of love is the one, which means that we are able to discern, not to give up, even to the, to the, to the pathological aspect of, of, of uh, love. Uh, there are many examples like this. We, the last time remember we talked about death, uh, we saw how, you know, sometimes even the most uh, obvious love of uh, the, the love of the parents for their children can sometimes become lustful, can become sentimental, can become pathological, will become opposite of love. For example, I told you the example of 
uh, the, the couple that lost their son, uh, he died in a motor, uh, in an accident, he was driving a motorbike and he killed, he was only 22, 23 years old. And um, they were going to the cemetery every day to wash up his tomb, to give a meal, even though his son was dead for 10 years, 20 years now. When I remember when I was a priest, when I went to see them, uh, I would see them there every day. And I would ask them, why do you do this? Why do you come here? Well, you know, they started our son died so long, but he died 10 years ago. Why don't you move on with your life? It's okay to grieve. It's okay to, but one day you're going to go. Why don't you pray for him as Christians that, you know, uh, uh, you, you also, you know, will, will, will transfigure this love to him through praying into the church, not by uh, constantly dwelling uh, and hovering over his cemetery, over his uh, tomb. Um, so even though we understand their pain, uh, sometimes though that kind of uh, uh, not transfigured love can easily become uh, a love of uh, of the pathological uh, character, it can become a pathological one. In many, many aspects, I, I don't really want to talk about the perversions of today of legalizing everything that, uh, you know, uh, just uh, th that's the problem that, uh, you know, in the, in the world we live, the relativism of everything brings everything to, everything goes, everything it's okay. And you can just give the title, it's love, and, and, and it's, I guess it's okay. This is something that as Orthodox Christians we can agree with. And the church will always be against it, always. Uh, not because the church wants to be against it, but because the church can then uh, come in terms with it. We need to know our faith in order to move on. So what I wanted to show you now, uh, let me see here. Uh, this is something I wanted to, uh, maybe when we have time, you let me know if you want to talk about it. We, I was talking about maybe next time we can talk about prayer, memorial service, memorial for the departed. and talk about the future judgments from the very words from St. Paisios um, and, and some other uh, fathers, we can talk about uh, Archimandrit, uh, um, uh, Ephraim of uh, Vatopedi Monastery. He's, uh, um, he lives in the monastery. He talks about the sudden death. What happens to us when we that he refers to some fathers who are important to, to know what is the Orthodox understanding. And that one we can talk about what is the, what does the phrase uh, eternal memory mean remember when you seek when somebody dies what is the remembrance of death and what does it mean for us this is something uh, that we can talk a little bit more uh, uh, about that and then there is uh, this text by saint john maximovich of shanghai and san francisco who describes uh, the first 40 days after death that's why you hear remember when somebody dies we say we do the again we do seven days we do uh, 40 days, and then we have six months and a year, uh, special days when we commemorate the person who has died because they all have meaning. So in his footnotes and his uh, uh, references here, we can, we can talk about the passions, we can talk about the fathers of the church, what they had to say and so forth. I think it's an important topic because many of you have asked me on different occasions about this question, about what happens to us when we die, so we can maybe talk a little bit more about this in more extensively, so maybe cover certain topics that are important to understand. We don't have to do that, but it's up to you, but we can, we can tell you anyway, we have uh, plenty, plenty of things we want to cover. I would like to focus during the Great Lent more about the, uh, the Sundays uh, that are coming down to understand why do we fast, why do we go through this, why do we, what's the meaning of the, the publican and the Pharisee, what is the meaning of the reading of the gospel of the prodigal son or the last judgment, for the Forgiveness Sunday, and then on the Sunday of Orthodox and all of those, because they all have meaning. And uh, this is probably one of the most important uh, parts of the seasons of the, of the calendar year for us the, uh, going towards Pascha. So, okay, guys, that, that would be all that I can, uh, that I would like to talk about today. If you have any questions, feel free to ask something, and then uh, maybe we can say the prayer and finish for today. Hopefully, maybe Father Matthew will join us uh, next Wednesday. We'll see how it goes. But uh, until then, we'll see. We can. We have to cover a lot.